Hi, I'm Sebastian Mader from Penn State University. This is ESC 216, Advanced Scanning Probe Microscopy, Lecture 2. So we left off just with a recap of the principle of operation for our atomic force microscope. Um, these are the general components and we talked about these in substantial detail in the last lecture. So let's start this second lecture with some of the common modes of operation. And we'll finish up with some pitfalls and common image artifacts and also an example of instrument operation. So an AFM can actually be operated in a variety of different modes. The two modes we're going to cover will be what's called contact mode and tapping mode. Again, each mode has certain advantages and certain trade-offs. Um, in other words, there are certain scenarios where you would use one and not the other, and vice versa. In contact mode, the sample topography is measured by scanning the tip, which actually makes contact with the surface, and then scanned across the sample. This is a fairly popular mode of operation, um, and it's used primarily before hard or durable samples. Since the tip is in contact with the surface, damage to the tip and the sample may occur as scanning proceeds. The other thing we can get is we can gather information such as frictional forces. Uh, because they may also exist between the sample and tip. And we'll see these um, due to the, the, the pitching or rolling of the cantilever and then that um, laser beam deflection on the detector. Also, the tips can quickly become contaminated and wear down over time due to the fact that they are in contact, constant contact with the sample below. So in contact mode, again we have our detector which we're familiar with. Um, it's going to be picking up a, or providing a DC signal. We would start with a voltage set point, okay, and this would allow us to determine as an operator how hard or soft the tip will touch and press down onto our surface um, below. The higher the set point, the harder the contact. So in other words, the greater cantilever deflection. So we're pressing the cantilever harder uh, to apply a greater force down to the uh, sample below. When you do this, you, you need to watch for damage to uh, your sample. And this would look like horizontal streaking in your sample image once you're done with your scan. On the right, we just see um, that a lower set point would have a, a, a small voltage and uh, um, a higher set point would have harder contact, greater cantilever deflection, and that's why we see the, the laser beam a little bit above that central area. Um, here's an image of software that was used to uh, run an AFM scan. If we look on the left, uh, this was in contact mode by the way, on the left we see well how many data points did we gather per line? Well we we gathered 1024 data points. And so this is a, a, a 10 by 10 micron square so that would be 1024 times 1024 data points. So we're over a million data points plotted in this image here. Um, the image was acquired with a scan rate of 2 hertz, which tells us that it, it basically scanned two lines every second. And here we had no offset, so we just started from the bottom, started scanning in until we were finished. Good thing to point out here is that this image that we're looking at right here I think we, we already are aware of this, but it's worth saying again. This is not a picture, okay, in any sense of that word. It's not a, uh, it's not a, a photo, it's not an optical image. This was an image produced by basically plotting those one million data points step by step until we come up with this image. And what the software has done is it has taken the lowest values as far as height or the lowest features and it's basically coded them to be black. Um, the features which are kind of in the middle height range are this lighter orange. Taller features are a bit lighter orange and the tallest features would be white. 
So it appears like a top-down image that was taken with a with a camera. But again, this is very different. It's a it's a 3D plot of XYZ uh, data. And this sample actually happens to be a DVD. And um, if you weren't aware, the way that DVDs or oh, and CDs encode information is by having pits. Um, um, so these long channels, uh, which are kind of dug out below the surface of the CD or DVD. Um, the distance between these, what we call uh, tracks, um, in a CD is around 800 nanometers, whereas in a DVD it's a bit lower, so it's maybe around 560 nanometers. So that's why DVDs can hold more information, because if you can pack these bits closer together, and now you have a, a better memory and you can store more information. Now in non-contact mode, the instrument actually senses Van der Waals attractive forces between the surface and the probe that's held just above it. So there is never any contact between the tip and the sample below, although they're held very close to each other. But the whole time we are experiencing uh, an attraction, an attractive force between the cantilever and the sample below. Obviously this eliminates all damage to the surface uh, that could occur in contact mode. The best results in non-contact mode are again obtained in ultra high vacuum since we can remove that moisture from the surface that would normally create uh, the capillary forces in uh, ambient conditions. Now one other mode, which is called tapping mode or intermittent contact mode, is you can think of it as a cross between contact and non-contact. Um, in this mode, the cantilever is actually excited very close to its uh, natural resonant frequency, and it's and it's, it's excited by uh, an external piezoelectric uh, attachment. And don't confuse that with the piezoelectric scanner. This is a different tiny piezoelectric mounted. Um, onto the cantilever and um, it, it basically expands and contracts very quickly causing that cantilever vibration. Resonant frequencies typically range from 15 to 500 kilohertz. Okay? It's extremely fast frequency of oscillation, especially if we compare that to our rate of scanning. Our last scan that we looked at was 2 hertz. This can be as high as 500 thousand hertz. Um, the amplitude of the vibration, although it's, you know, although the frequency is very fast uh, or very high, the amplitude is usually in the 10 to 100 nanometer range. Tapping mode works it's extremely well for many different samples, including uh, soft, adhesive, or fragile surfaces. The reason is Tapping mode can overcome the common problems um, that arise uh, due to sample and probe interactions such as friction, adhesion, electrostatic forces, and other difficulties um, that arise with general contact mode techniques. So if we consider tapping mode and we look again at our force distance curve, we see that at the bottom of each vibration, uh, the tip comes very close to the surface and actually may, now I don't think that we lied to you, but it may actually contact it briefly. It depends what you consider contact. Uh, basically, there will be a Van der Waals attractive force and a Van der Waals repulsive force uh, for every oscillation. And that's, again, 15 to 500, uh, 15,000 to 500,000 kind of cycles a second. Therefore, there's an abrupt change from weak attraction to strong repulsive, and this happens very quickly and uh, continuously. The cantilever will be tuned in free space. You do this before you actually start your scan. It does not contact the sample, and we do this to determine its fundamental frequency or resonant frequency. What we do is we kind of modify um, 
the voltage to the piezoelectric, which is going to vibrate the, the cantilever at a kind of a, at different frequencies. The one that produces the maximum amplitude is the one uh, that we set as a drive frequency. As the vibrating tip approaches the sample, the interactions will dampen the amplitude of vibration, so they can decrease the amplitude. And there can also be a phase shift or phase lag that can be measured, and this will also provide us information about our sample, uh, because it tells us about the energy that's dissipated by that interaction. So these are different types of information we can get from the same tool uh, by just using a, a slightly different uh, tip, a tip with that piece of electric on it, and this uh, tapping mode configuration. Again, two types of information we can get. Let's say this is our resonant frequency, and so we drive the cantilever at this set point. And as we interact with our sample below, we could have a change in amplitude, which provides information, and or we could also have a phase shift data that we acquire, and that gives us uh, different information as well. Here's a uh, just a little schematic showing that we have our piezo, piezoelectric material attached to the cantilever. Um, we've determined our our resonant frequency, and so that's the frequency at which we drive that piezo. Then the signal from the detector obviously is going to be this very quick up, down, up, down, up, down. And um, what we're going to be looking at for that change in amplitude or phase shift is going to actually be the difference between our drive frequency and what we actually see occurring um, on the cantilever. And, and, you know, the way we see or measure that is from looking at the phase shift or amplitude change of the output signal. And why would this phase shift or amplitude change? Because this tip is, of course, interacting now with our sample. It's no longer in free space. Here's an image showing us um, what it's like when you're tuning the cantilever. So you go through a range of uh, drive frequencies until you get the maximum amplitude, and that's what you select as your drive frequency. And then what do you compare, or what does your computer compare? Um, that drive frequency compared to the output from the detector, and you'll have a phase shift or amplitude change. The phase shift, again, is one type of data that you can get. Um, this information is, of course, not available in contact mode. Why? It's pretty simple. In contact mode, there's no phase to be shifted. Okay, Your cantilever is not moving up and down, vibrating. It's in constant contact. Uh, so that's the reason why we can derive this new information from tapping mode as opposed to contact or even non-contact modes. Um, here's an actual image from the software. Um, the last image was kind of a simplified view of of what your amplitude looks like when you're driving your cantilever at different frequencies. This is a, a more accurate one. This is actually from our software when we tune a cantilever in free space. You'll get a peak amplitude and this one happens to be about 307,000 Hertz. So when you're approaching the sample, you tune the cantilever first in free space. You select a drive frequency um, while you're tuning, and that does not change during the approach or while you're scanning. You maintain that drive frequency that's set for the maximum amplitude of that uh, cantilever oscillation. So the maximum amplitude oscillation occurs when the tip is in free space, not affected by tip sample interactions. Now, as you approach the tip and start making that intermittent contact with the sample, um, the interaction will, will dampen the oscillation of the cantilever. Okay? This might um, change the amplitude or the phase. And then if the drive frequency does not match the output frequency or you know, there's a phase lag or amplitude shift, um, 
then this is basically detuning the cantilever and, and the piezo piezoelectric will have to make the appropriate changes and we can record that data and eventually plot it um, in that 3D representation that makes sense to us. So again, we set that drive frequency in air, we engage a sample, we'll have a shift. In this case, it was a shift in amplitude. And the shift is due to the tip surface interactions. Again, the approach, the scan, um, different amplitudes or phase changes. The piezoelectric is still being controlled uh, by the feedback loop in order to uh, keep uh, maintain a constant height. So it's trying to keep that amplitude constant, although changes are being made. And every time it changes, uh, the feedback loop sends a signal to the piezo to move the sample up or down accordingly. This is what it would look like on the detector. We have an AC signal. We have our laser spot moving up and down constantly. Uh, the cantilever is oscillating at a certain drive amplitude and free space. As we come into contact, it's going to try, the, the feedback loop is going to try to maintain that set point which corresponds to that uh, oscillation amplitude. Okay, again, interaction with the sample will decrease that amplitude. And if we have a higher voltage uh, set point, we'll have lighter tapping. A lower voltage set point would be harder tapping. So this is the opposite um, of what you might think, and it's the opposite of what we had occur in contact mode. So this higher... Uh, kind of higher amplitude here is actually softer tapping versus the smaller amplitude, uh, which is harder tapping. In addition to height information then, we can get information about the interaction of the tip in a sample. Uh, this can provide details of viscoelasticity, um, kind of the energy uh, or surface energy also, the, the phase shift data will give us relative information, and it'll tell us about, this is pretty interesting, the phase image will actually give us information about a sample even when there's no change in height. So there's absolutely no height difference. Let's say a sample is uh, be atomically smooth or better. Uh, imagine an infinitely smooth surface. We would, we would actually still be able to gather information and differences if there were, say, two different types of materials present on that uh, infinitely smooth surface. We would still be able to detect that due to the phase shift uh, lag or amplitude change from the tip sample interaction. Here we have a great example of that. Um, so here's our extremely smooth surface but it's got two different types of materials, a blue region, a red region, and a blue region just colored, you know, for, for the purpose of explaining this. And here's our drive frequency, and then we have some type of output, which is going to be different than the drive frequency. Well, going over the blue sample, we have a, this a small phase lag. All of a sudden, over the red sample, we have a much larger phase lag. And over the blue sample, again, that small phase lag. So what does that mean? That means we're, we're seeing very clearly that these are unique regions on the surface of a sample. Even though there's no difference in height, there is differences in composition, and we can pick that up using phase contrast in uh, tapping mode AFM. So when you plot this information and it looks like a, like a picture or a 3D image, what you're actually plotting is not height, but you're plotting this phase lag, but we use a color scale in order to produce an image that makes sense um, to us. So the next slide shows this clearly. On the left here is just height data. Okay, This is just telling you height. So it's saying, oh, this whitish areas, we have some kind of hills, okay? 
some valleys here in the darker areas, and then we see these certain fuzzy features in the background. But if you switch over to phase shift data, okay, now you're not really worried about that height information at all. But now we have very clear uh, contrast and higher resolution imaging of the different types of materials present in this pretty flat sample. Um, you can't tell because there are no scales here, but this is a uh, block copolymer of polystyrene and polymethyl methacrylate. And this sample overall um, does not have a very great variation in height. So, you know, this hill might be three nanometers taller than this, what looks like a valley. Three nanometers is not much. Uh, that's a pretty flat surface. But again, look at the phase shift data. We can clearly see the distinction of where certain regions are polystyrene, okay, um, a polymer material, and then certain regions are polymethyl methacrylate, another different uh, polymer material with different properties, obviously different surface energies and uh, viscoelasticity and things of that nature. Lastly, in our discussion of atomic force microscopy, we're going to introduce just a few pitfalls and image artifacts, and, uh, and then finally we'll give an example of instrument operation. So some common problems. If a sample is not clean, dust particles can and will interfere with scanning. Other issues, an improperly aligned laser and or detector will give you a low signal. If your signal is not low enough, or sorry, if your signal is not great enough, then your sig signal to noise ratio will be um, insufficient and uh, you won't have reliable data and you'll have too much background noise. Also, you, we can accumulate many different types of image artifacts due to a damaged or even slightly contaminated tip. And another one, a common problem, is a feedback loop which is not tuned properly. Remember, you have control over the P, I, and D uh, aspects of your feedback loop. So it's very important to adjust those properly uh, to avoid common things such as overshoot, ringing, uh, there's some other terms that are thrown around like uh, uh, parachuting um, and scarring and, and things of that nature. Here are a few um, examples. Uh, this is an image uh, created from AFM. These are all from AFM scans and this is produced from a dull or dirty tip. So what happens is if you have a dull or dirty tip, oftentimes your image will actually be produced and will it'll actually be showing you the topography of your tip and not the topography of your sample. And you'll get a lot of this uh, ghosting and a repeated pattern. So all these, which uh, they look like pyramidal uh, features, they, they, they don't really exist. They're, they're an image artifact rendered by a dirty tip. Another example of that is if you had a contaminated or slightly chipped tip and um, it causes tip doubling or even tripling. So now when you're scanning across a sample, you know, maybe there were 10 gold nanoparticles on this image, but since you have a, a tip uh, contaminated enough to do tip doubling, you're going to see a lot of kind of twins and uh, a doubling of the true uh, particles that were present there in the first place. So about two-thirds of these particles here are not, act not actually there. Um, another common artifact is optical interference. This occurs if you have laser uh, spillover or if part of your laser beam um, it's spilling over the cantilever and it's being reflected back to the detector. Well, what you're going to end up picking up is that that kind of optical interference pattern uh, from the laser uh, light itself, and that will come up looking as a series of of waves throughout your image. Um, another one, the tip not tracking. This would be, and there are different versions of this. This would occur if your feedback loop is not uh, set up appropriately. 
And if you don't notice these things, you know, you, you might think that these are that these are real, that these are actual um, features on your sample. So it's important to be aware, uh, to learn about the different types of artifacts that may occur, and also to learn how to uh, avoid them and or correct them. By the way, as far as a tip not tracking, also sometimes called parachuting, what's happening is since your feedback loop is not set up right, as you scan from left to right here, your tip is doing a good job at, at tracking the surface, at least initially it's going up the particle, but then instead of falling back down quickly on the back side, it's taking a long time to come back down to the surface. And uh, that's occurring because your feedback loop is off and you're not maintaining that, that uh, constant tip uh, sample interaction as, as you would like. So it ends up looking like a teardrop shape instead of a sphere. Lastly, as promised, we're going to talk about uh, and show an example of actually using a, a real tool, so instrument operation. So here are, tool, here are two examples of scanning probe microscopes. Um, one of these would be a Vico CP2. This is here on the left. And on the right, there's a Vico Innova. Now, on both of these, you're going to see similar features. And another thing to point out is, on the left here, this giant uh, T-shaped structure here in black, that's actually just a big arm on a swivel used uh, to hold an optical microscope. And here we see a smaller version. So you might be wondering, why do we need an optical microscope? Well, the only reason it's there is to help us align the laser onto the cantilever, because that is, uh, we mentioned that that has to be done by manual control. You have to manually turn that mirror to get the laser down onto the cantilever. Um, as far as specifications, uh, typically you have a scan range, again, near 100 microns. Um, sample sizes, it depends on the, on the manufacturer, but around 50 by 50 uh, by 20 millimeters. Um, the optics, not that big of a deal, but typically you're going to have a, a CCD mounted um, optical microscope. Some DAC control in the electronics, and then there are different, definitely different types of software to interact with your tool. So a closer look, we see the optical microscope. Below this we have our probe head. And our probe head is basically what's going to hold our uh, cantilever and tip eventually. And below the probe head, we see the top of our piezoelectric scanner. And right above this, there's a, a magnetized metal plate uh, for holding our samples. So here's a closer look at how we would actually uh, you know, if you've ever thought about how do you hold a cantilever that's, that's so small and a tip that goes down to 20 nanometers. Well, one way that you can get these is they already come packaged on a little tiny chip of silicon here, which is glued onto uh, a ceramic piece called a chip carrier. And the chip carrier has three small holes. And those holes, it basically snaps into place here. Um, below this spring. You open this with the spring tool, you snap in your chip carrier, which is again glued to the chip, which contains your cantilever and probe. And there, there are different types of probe cartridges, uh, one for contact. The main difference is if it's tapping mode, you're going to have a little piezoelectric and uh, some, some electrical contacts. So basically, you use a spring tool, open up that spring, um, insert your pre-mounted tip, that's that white chip carrier, carefully clip it into place. Then you take this whole uh, probe cartridge, and I'll show you later that we'll, we'll enter it into the probe head. As far as mounting a sample, you just need a small metal disc, some double-sided, typically carbon sticky tape, 
and then you carefully press your sample down onto that tape, uh, which is secured onto the metal disc. Then that you can just put right on top of your piezoelectric scanner. So here we show uh, a sample, which is mounted on top of that metal disc, and then we're sliding it right on top of the piezoelectric. It is important to mention not to snap that disc down. You need to slide it on, otherwise you could uh, damage the piezoelectric material below. As far as preparing the instrument, you need to check the probe head and make sure there won't be any collision. Carefully slide the probe cartridge into the probe head. So here's our probe cartridge holding our chip and cantilever. Slide it into the probe head and now you swing the optical microscope back in place. It's going to swing in right here and it's going to be looking down at our cantilever to help us with laser alignment. Here's a side view. Piezoelectric, uh, metal, uh, magnetic plate, uh, the magnetic disc with our sample on it, the cantilever, the chip, the chip carrier, <clears throat> the probe cartridge, and this is all inside the probe head. Um, so again, we said laser um, alignment is done manually using mirrors. So in this example, you have two knobs that help you rotate the mirror. And you basically, you need to find the laser, move it to the end of the chip, and then walk the laser out to the end of the cantilever until it's in the correct location uh, right here basically centered between these three angles <clears throat> then you need to make some adjustments on your detector um, so what you would do is move the knobs which move the second mirror and and get your laser adjusted onto the detector and you want to get close to center, and then you can start to use the software to look at the actual voltages. So centered would be voltages absolute zero, um, 0, 0.000. So you want to get as close as possible and double check that your total signal is, uh, is of adequate uh, voltage. So when you're ready to do a scan, you can choose the, the samples per line. Um, your scan rate, your scan range. Here you can manipulate your set point and PID controls of the feedback loop. And while you're actively scanning, you'll see this profile, uh, which is very typical of uh, SPM software. And it's showing you the forward and backward traces. So the way the SPM works is um, it will scan forward and backwards in the exact same spot. And the reason it does this is this helps you notice if there are differences between the two line scans and then you should be able to look at those differences and adjust your feedback loop accordingly until they are they match more closely ideally you would have two lines um, exactly you know on top of each other so we've seen this picture before uh, this is our CD. Now we're going to show how to take a quick measurement within the software. You would select the cross-section measurement tool, drag it, and again the great part of an AFM image is it's not just a picture. It's, you know, it might be over a million data points plotted. So because you have all that information you can quickly click and drag. When you let go you're going to see this. A profile. Okay, an extremely accurate profile of the topography for that line segment in your scan. So let me go back. Here was our DVD. We're finished with the scan. We click and drag. I'm going to see like like a plateau, uh, a well, a plateau, a well, a plateau, a well. And here it is. Well, well, well. And kind of the plateaus in between. You can do a quick measurement uh, for sample height or sample distance. In this case, we see the what's called the pitch distance, the distance between the tracks on a CD, about 740 nanometers there.
So in summary, scanning probe techniques enable nanoscale characterization. We saw that STM measures the tunneling current between a metal tip and a conductive sample, and AFM is suitable for both conducting and insulating or non-conductive materials. There are a variety of AFM scanning techniques that are available, including contact, tapping mode, and non-contact modes. And each technique offers its own benefits and needs to be chosen based upon the properties of the sample. One or two references worth mentioning here are Ron Reifenberger and Arvin Rahman. Um, and the other one would be a NanoHub resource that you could visit online.